I've, told, I've probably mentioned the stories before. When Anita and I first came down to Phoenix, I was trying to, you know, start working on my uh, higher education, and I found out that I was missing some basic classes. So we decided to take some courses at Glendale Community College. Boy, were they ready to get rid of me. Because <laughs> you guys all know I'm no, I, I, I don't mix words. And uh, so they, they put you in this big auditorium with about two, 300 kids. And they have uh, five different teachers. Teachers teach about 45 minutes apiece, one right after another. Humanities, I think, is what they called it. And I didn't have any humanity classes. Because I went to DeVry, Institute of Technology. We weren't interested in humanity classes. <laughs> we were interested in electronics and programming and all that kind of stuff. So I had to take this class before I could get a master's and eventually a doctorate. And uh, so I had no idea how bad it was. So I listened to these adult teachers brainwashing these kids was such vile nonsense that my hackles were probably easily seen in the whole class. And I'd jump up and I'd challenge them. And they, they would back off. they go, well, we don't mean this to be an argument. So, well, you got one. <laughs> so, look at these kids. And I call them that. I said, kids, they're all writing down every word you said like it was somehow or another it was a gospel or something. And I looked at all these kids and said, none of that's true. None of that's true. And uh, uh, we had one particular teacher, he was a so-called religious teacher, said Christianity was founded by the Egyptian religion. What? I go, what? And he said, yeah, it says, if you, you notice on the, on the hieroglyphics, I'll add the symbol of the fish is very prominent. And what's the symbol of Christianity? The fish. I go, time out. And I jumped up. I says, what are you saying? Well, and he was taken back because they're so used to kids just taking whatever they say. So I got in his face. That nonsense leading kids to the, the fires of hell because of some stupid belief like that. And so I got in his face and Nita and I had a, had a, had a good time with those. I, I don't know, it's not a good time, but we had a good time ourselves <laughs> challenging all these people. And the kids had that look of fear on their face, like, oh, oh my God, he spoke back to the professor. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I didn't mind, it didn't bother me one bit. You know, there are good professors, there are bad professors. If there are bad professor, I'm gonna get in their face. And uh, to teach nonsense and destroy the belief and faith of our kids. And that's what they wanna do. They wanna destroy the belief of our kids and the faith of our kids by saying, I think they all read the same book. It must say, how to destroy your student's faith book. Because I hear the same things being said to all of them. They must have this book they read, how to destroy the faith of your students. They keep saying the same things over and over again. They say, well, you know, just, just, their God they believe in must be a mean God. Because he makes the women, when they're on their menstrual cycles, go away from the camp out there in the desert with all the snakes and scorpions and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's a mean God that makes the women leave camp like that. All alone, all alone out there. You, you, you get this vision of some poor lady in ragged clothes crawling on, on the ground wanting water somewhere, you know. That's not the way it was. There was a court of the women, a camp of the women that was set aside from the main camp. They were well taken care of. They were fed and watered. And the older children had to stay with the husband. Only the little kids went with the wife. It was a vacation. <laughs> but these dumb professors make it sound like what a horrible God to kick the women out of court, out of the regular court. I said, oh my gosh, you know, where, where are you guys going with this? And so they pick and choose certain scriptures in the Bible and try to make it sound like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was just a mean God. They don't know what they're talking about. And so, um, so I encourage all you students, pay close attention to what the Bible says. And if you get challenged in your school, talk to your parents. Talk to those that know the Word of God. And say, they said this. And believe you me, they will tell you, don't tell your parents this. Because they don't want you to come back and say, hey, that's not true. 
They will tell you that. When they do that, rebuke them. I don't keep secrets from my parents. And I don't keep secrets from God. Just tell them those things. And don't let them mess with your mind and heart. Because they will try to use the entire class against you. They will, they will use peer pressure and the class to shut you up. They're very good at what they do. They've been doing it for years. And they know how to do these things. Don't allow them to do it to you. Be bold. And fear not. Al-tirah, al tirah fear not. Hazek, hazek, be bold, be bold before God himself. So do not let those professors teach you nonsense. They don't know what they're talking about. They might know something about some subject or teaching, when, if it's something in science or something like that. But these guys, most of these guys are there to destroy, and humanity classes especially, are there to destroy the faith of the students. Anyway. Huh? We got an A. And the reason we got the reason we got an A is because one professor says, "Well, if it's on the test, you better put it down the way I said it." So I told the kids, "Put it down the way he said it, and then tell him this is the real truth." So that's what we did. He says, "You said this." But this is what the real truth is, the right, the right answer down. He couldn't mark me wrong. I knew what he said, and there it is on the test. But I got in their face. The nonsense. How many lives have they destroyed doing stuff like that? Anyway, let me get off my soapbox. Okay. <laughs> you got to be strong. You got to be bold. Today we're going to be talking about the eighth day. The eighth day, Shemini Atzeret is the word. Shemini Atzeret is the Sabbath day right at the end of Tabernacles. So when you celebrate Tabernacles, the Sukkot, the booth, for seven days, the very next day is known as the eighth day assembly, Shemini Atzeret. And it is a Sabbath day. It is a Moed, but it stands alone. You will read uh, on the internet and many other writings how the Shemini Atzeret represents many, many things. Every, every Jewish group has a different idea what it means. And then some say, oh, it's just, it's just a closing of Sukkot. That's all. Just like Shavuot Shavu or Pentecost was the closing of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, not quite, because there was a big gap between there. But Shemini Atzeret is a stand alone. Moed, and I'll explain why as we move along here. It's important to know these things. How many of you ever heard of Shemini Atzeret? See what I mean? Few of you do. It's important stuff to know. Every Moed in the Bible has got meaning behind it and stuff that God wants us to know about. But there's not a, probably a single church out there that teaches on Shemini Atzeret. And these kind of things are important. You know, the last day of Sukkot is called Hoshan Rabal, the Great Salvation. And the very day after that is Shemini Atzeret. It is a Sabbath day. And uh, when I talk about Sabbath day, there's seven of the Sabbath day in the year besides the weekly Sabbaths. Seven of them. It's important to know that or you get Scripture messed up. Here I'm talking about the Sabbath day. And if you didn't know what Sabbath day they were talking about, your timelines will get all messed up. So it's important to know there are seven other Sabbaths in the year, besides weekly Sabbath days, Shemini Atzeret is one of those. You can find the, the celebration and mention of this Shemini Atzeret in Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 43. And then you can read about it in Numbers 35, 38, Second Chronicles 7, 9, and 1 Kings chapter 8. These all talk about the eighth day. The eighth day is very important. Last week I told you that, you know, tabernacles itself, the spiritual fulfillment, even physical fulfillment of tabernacles is about the thousand year millennial reign of the Messiah. So if tabernacles represents a thousand years of the millennial reign, Shemini Atzeret, which stands alone, has to be a separate incident that occurs after the millennial reign. What is that incident? 
the great white throne judgment. Eighth day assembly is what it means. What great assembly will take place immediately after the millennial reign? The great white throne judgment. Where everybody that ever lived will be resurrected at that point. It's called the second resurrection. But the Bible goes on and says, Blessed are those who are in the first resurrection, for the power of the second death is not upon you. What does that mean? When you're in the first resurrection, you enter into eternal life. That's the first fruits resurrections. That's the barley and wheat spring resurrection, the rapture. When I say re resurrection, I'm talking about raptures. That's what I'm talking about. So if you are caught up in the first fruits resurrections, the lake of fire, which is the second death, will have no power over you. But those involved in the second resurrection, everybody will be resurrected, folks. Everybody. Maybe for a short period of time, but everybody will be resurrected. It's important to know this, that no one stays in the grave that are there now, but they may go back and be destroyed. So what happens is that it says that even death and hell are destroyed in the lake of fire. Hell empties itself out. So people that go to hell will remain in hell even through the millennial reign until the great white throne judgment where there's a gathering of anybody and any and all people that ever lived and those people in hell at that point will be resurrected and then set before the throne of God and judged for their final judgment. And if they're not found written in the book of life, they will be thrown in the lake of fire. What is the lake of fire? The lake of fire is annihilation, it's final judgment. We'll talk a little bit about that as we move along here. So, Atzeret is a solemn gathering. It comes from the root word Atzar, which means to stop or to tarry. So some rabbis believe that Shemini Atzeret is just a day extra that you linger with God. That's what they teach. A little day extra you're going to ling linger with God because he wants to spend so much time with you. Well, there may be a little truth to that, but not completely. Because the great white throne judgment, if you if you found are found written in the book of life, you'll be tearing with God for the rest of eternity if you're found in the book of life. Even writings in the Talmud, which are the rabbi writings, said that the eighth day is a festival in its own right. They also says another root meaning of the word is to gather, to store up. Well, that's exactly what it's talking about, assembly. To gather, to store, every man, every woman, every child, whatever, will now face the great white throne judgment. And when they face the great white throne judgment, what does that mean? That means that their book of works will be open and presented to God. And everything you ever said and did will be revealed at that moment. And after that judgment, it determined whether you're written in the book of life or not. If you are part of the first resurrection... You'll be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the Lamb's Book of Life is the book you want to be written in. You don't want to be written in, uh, just rely on the Book of Life because you're flipping a coin there. You're written in the Lamb's Book of Life if you believe in Yeshua. And that's what we want to do. There's no waving of the lulav and no or etrog. You're not required to live in the sukkah on Shemini Atzeret. Remember I told you last week, the sukkah represents your flesh, your body, and that we all live in a sukkah right now, where God dwells, Emmanuel. Become the resurrection, after the rapture, the first resurrection, whatever, you will have a new body that will no longer be a sukkah. That's why the sukkah is always a temporary shelter, indicating decay, because decay, it's got to be made out of wood and branches and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and as far as biblical representation goes. So, what is the main, one of the main things that happens on a, a Shemini Atzeret? Memorial prayers are said. Prayers for rain begin. Begins the rainy season. When God said he'll pour out his Holy Spirit upon all flesh, this is what he's talking about. 
So at this point, God, those who have survived that judgment, the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them. Upon all flesh, the Holy Spirit will be poured out. But even today in Israel, a few days ago, they had the Shemini Atzeret. It begins the rainy season. And folks, I just looked it up on the weather report. This week, they're getting their first rains in Israel. Somehow or another, God has got his hand over the weather of Israel all the time. And so at, that's why it doesn't rain on tabernacles. Because if God's going to require you to live outside in a very leaky booth, <laughs> he's not going to allow rain to fall upon you. But amazingly, after Shemini Atzeret, the rainy season begins and continues until Passover. It is the rainy season. And if you don't believe me, look up the world weather reports and, uh, and you're already going to see there's going to be rain in Israel this week. So that's God's schedule, how it works. Out. So they also say the Shekiyanu, the blessing on Shemini Atzeret. But the Shekiyanu blessing is for any Moed, is for any holiday, it's for any festival. You say the Shekiyanu. And I'm going to say the Shekiyanu today. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shekiyanu Vekimanu Vihiyanu Lazmin Haze. It means blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of all who has kept us alive and sustained us and brought us to this season. So in other words, they, they say the Shekiyanu because they're glad to be alive on this festival. They're glad to be alive during the season of God. They do say that quite a bit. One of the things the rabbis talk about, because it's one of the definitions of Shemini Azaret is supposed to tarry, and they say that one of the, besides tarrying with God, you are to the excitement of the festivals that you're in, the closeness of God you felt during those festivals, you are to maintain that closeness the rest of the year. That's what they say. So when you feel the Spirit of God moving on you in the fall festivals, you are supposed to maintain that feeling all the rest of the year. Yeah, that's kind of difficult, but I think it's a good, it's a good goal to shoot for. It also represents the temple dedication by Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, 9 and 1 Kings 8. It actually tells you in those scriptures that there was an assembly held on the eighth day. Book of Maccabees talks about it and Hanukkah talks about the eighth day celebration. There's a lot of things that talk about the eighth day celebration in the Bible. There is one particular Jewish group called the Karite Jews that, that keep Shemini Atzeret as a biblical celebration. Now the day after Shemini Atzeret is Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah means when you're beginning to start to read the Bible from the beginning again, or the Torah from the beginning. The Karite Jews don't do that. They said there was no commandment in the Bible for us to start reading Torah again at this time from the beginning. But there is a commandment for Shemini Atzeret. So the Karite Jews, they celebrate Shemini Atzeret, but not Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah, by the way, is a rabbinical concept. There's nothing in the Bible that, that supports uh, um, what we do with the Torah. Shemini Atzeret also means to collect or store. What does eight mean in the Bible? New beginnings. So remember what I was talking about? It is new beginnings. In this case, it's talking about eternity. Shemini Atzeret is the last Moed because it represents eternity. After that final great white throne judgment, those entering into eternal life will be going into eternal life at that time. Those who are set for annihilation will be destroyed with the lake of fire. There's no time anymore after Shemini Atzeret. Time goes away. Let's talk a little bit about annihilation. 
Matthew 10, verse 28. Yeshua said, Do not fear him who destroys the body, but fear him who destroys the body and the soul. See, Yeshua is saying, the body and the soul or the spirit can be destroyed. It's Greek philosophy that teaches that the, the spirit is eternal. It's not eternal. God gave the spirit, but it's not eternal. He can also destroy it. So Yeshua says, fear him who can destroy both. Proverbs 10, 7 says that, that once you die, the wicked, once they die, will rot and decay. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 says, even their memory will be forgotten. So all these things are talking about things in the Bible that even the spirit's going to be destroyed down the line. When people say, oh, they're going to roll around in eternity all their life. Well, that's eternal life. You ought to tell people that when they say that. Hit them with that, saying, oh, no, I believe, I believe they suffer for all eternity. Well, then they have eternal life. Well, I didn't mean it that way. What way did you mean it? It says, the soul that sinned dies. It does not offer eternal life. So it says, when God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believed in him shall not perish. That means utter destruction, but have eternal life. So if somebody's rolling around the lake of fire for all their life, that's eternal life too. Not a good one, but it's eternal life also. No, you are destroyed. Annihilation, you are gone. There is nothing that tells you you suffer for all eternity. Some people pull scriptures out of there and talk about the smoke and the fire of it lasts forever and ever and ever. Well, maybe, maybe the place and the smoke and the fire does, but the people in it don't. And a lot of those scriptures about Gehenna and stuff like that are talking about a judgment of those who receive the mark of the beast. And it'd be right outside the walls of Jerusalem. And it says, where the fire never goes out and the worm dies not, Yeshua said. That's talking about a judgment against people who received the mark of the beast. It is not indicating rolling around in there for all eternity. Even Isaiah, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says when the people come to the Temple Mount, they will look into the valley off the side and see the bones of those that had burned in the Valley of Gehom. So they don't live. They're not suffering for all eternity. Stop and th think about that. I'd rather believe in a God that terminates somebody's existence than to believe in a God that gives them forever and ever and ever and ever torment. That's not our God. Our God does, I don't care what they have done. Nobody deter deserves all eternity torment. It doesn't matter what they have done. It's a more loving God to finish them off completely where they cease to exist. Because in the New Jerusalem, it says there's no tears. If you've got a loved one rolling around forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever in the lake of fire, how can you not have tears? God wants you to enter into eternal life completely at peace with no tears. The best way for you to do that is to make sure that your loved ones that didn't make it are annihilated. Their memory is wiped out of your mind where you don't even remember them anymore. That's why he does those kind of things. It's out of love that he finishes it off. Because remember, all will be revealed and you will know everything. That means you'll be able to look over there at the lake of fire and seeing somebody you know rolling around the lake of fire if that's the case. That will not happen. God will block that from you. So, it's called annihilation. And that's really what Semini Atzeret is about. Those things. It's a great white throne judgment that will take place. The scripture comes out of Revelation 20, verse 11. It said, Heaven and earth fled away from the face of the one who sat on the throne. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small, great, and stand before God. The books were open, and another book was open, the book of life. The dead were judged from what was written in their books of works. And all the dead in hell were delivered uh, all delivered its souls, and they were judged according to their works. 
Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. In whosoever not found in the book of life was cast into the fire. Why would they call something the second death if it wasn't exactly that, second death? If you didn't, weren't destroyed again or died again, why would they call it a, a second death if they meant, if you really meant eternal life or eternal life and suffering? I had somebody say, oh, that just means separation from God. Second death did not mean separation from God. It's you die again. You're resurrected to final judgment, then you die again. That's what that means. How did the church